What I asked to speak to you about today was your reactions to the IPCC's just released report, which tells what we've got to do, if I understand correctly, if we want to stay within 1.5 degrees centigrade of pre-industrial average temperature levels. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. good. So the IPCC, which has been notably underestimating the severity and the speed for the past 20 or 30 years, however long they've been in existence, now they seem to be getting with the program. They, the, the, what I'm hearing in the blogosphere is that this report is more properly alarming. Well, it is alarming, but in a sense it has to be because the IPCC has tended to be quite complacent in, in the way that it's, it's handled global warming and soft pedaled on certain kind of self-reinforcing feedbacks that people worry about. I mean, that I worry about and a lot of people worry about are, are the, the feedback mechanisms which are liable to eventually lead us to some sort of runaway warming. Mm-hmm. And those are things like the, the methane feedback, the, the uh, um, sea level rise feedback, the, um, the albedo feedback. IPCC has tended to soft pedal on those to the extent of actually forgetting some of them or hoping they don't they don't exist by not mentioning them like <laughs> hoping they go away <laughs> yes it is to say well if something if they don't mention it then and it, if, if they're uncertain what its magnitude will be then by not mentioning it it sort of goes away entirely and you don't you don't have to deal with it and uh, there's some classic cases there like the, the case of offshore uh, of methane from the offshore whether that could could expand to be a to be a major threat, uh, it, it won't in the IPC's view because they don't consider it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, when you look at the new report, you you hope that that they've mended some of these, but they've mended some of them, but not all. And really, they still have the same mental view that we just need to do more of the same and even more of the same to keep temperatures down to one point five. Uh, rather than two. And um, so it's still, there's a big stress on CO2 emissions reduction, um, except that it's, it's so obvious that at 1.5, you have to focus on, on carbon dioxide removal. Focusing on emissions reduction is, is simply not valid because even if we uh, actually had stopped emissions altogether, then the, the, the level of, C- of CO2 in the atmosphere would be enough to drive us. Already enough to, to carry, us, carry us past. Already built in. Mm-hmm. Do they talk about um, uh, emissions, not just reductions, about withdrawal, about carbon withdrawal in this new well, report? They do, yes, uh, but, but they don't go into the magnitude of the, of the reduction that's going to be needed. I mean, they say, well, we will have to have CO2 um, removal from the atmosphere. But they don't, what they ought to be doing is going into how much CO2 removal per year is going to be needed to keep the warming down to 1.5. And that's, that number is very large. It's, it's, um, it's at least 20 billion tonnes. I mean, it, it's, a, it's about 40 or 50 percent of what our present emissions are mm. uh, is the amount we have to just take out of the atmosphere to, to, to keep the warming down below 1.5 and that's such a massive um, su- such a massive commitment uh, such such a, a kind of a huge industry is going to be needed that will change everybody's life that uh, it needs to be considered as part of the warning. I mean, the warning's not meant to be just a warning, watch out or else. The mm-hmm. warning should be, look, just... unless we do this, we've had it, but this is what we have to do. They don't say what we have to do. They don't get specific. So that, they really so, still soft pedal on these tipping points, the, soft, the self-reinforcing feedbacks. And one of them, I'm just reading what they say, um, is, of course, sea ice, which I know most about, and you, you look for what they say about sea ice, and it's daft. Um, they say that uh, if we can keep global warming to 1.5 degree, then there'll be an ice-free summer only once every 100 years. What? Uh, <laughs> once every 100 years, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have an ice-free summer. 
But of course, we know that, that from maybe next year, maybe the year after, we're going to have an ice-free summer and then nothing but ice-free summers. And that's, that's nothing to do with plus 1.5. It's, it's the situation as it is now. And that's so the, as well as saying ice-free summers once every 100 years at 1.5, to say that if we let the temperature rise to 2 degrees, there'll be an ice-free summer every 10 years. But even that is, again, equally daft because we know, we know that that's not the case. So we're looking at, this is the kind of thinking of the, the old-fashioned modelers, the ones who were, not, who were way behind the curve and saying we wouldn't have ice-free conditions until the end of the century. Uh, that, that sort of modeling, one thought they would be embarrassed enough by reality to to withdraw that kind of a modelling approach. But here it is back again, and um, pretending that the situation isn't the way it is. Um, and I notice that there isn't a, a sea ice, a well-known sea ice researcher's name on the author list. So presumably the authors looked up what, what was the conventional wisdom oh. on, on sea ice. And they said, oh, yeah, the models say it won't disappear until the end of the century. Uh, oh. So... We'll put that down, and um, but it's it's wrong. So when there's something like that, something as serious as that, that they get completely wrong, then one doesn't feel too confident about the rest. Oh.